introduce the lovely Jody An Judy Anderson. <laughs> she is a spa coordinator with CTN, mm -hmm. and um, I know her as being um, uh, a, an amazing advocate for families that have language barriers or social uh, economic kind of barriers. She has a, a wonderful voice for that group of families and and others, and so welcome. Thank you. Hi, <laughs> I'm Judy and I am a single plan of care coordinator with Children's Treatment Network hosted by York Region District School Board funded by the Ministry of Children and Youth. <laughs> so that's kind of, but that's not really who I am. I'm really a mom. I have three kids. I have five grandchildren. And right now I'm very much a daughter. I have a mom who is 92 and a half. And um, I have to work very hard for her as an advocate right now. So I've kind of, I'm learning as we go. And the job that I do with CTN has really helped me a lot. Um, in my past life, I was a teacher and I was um, a special education coordinator for the York Region District School Board. So I have a lot of um, knowledge about special education um, and I am learning so much right now because as a single plan of care coordinator, as Sherry said, my um, job takes me mainly to Markham in York Region and um, I am learning so much about the different communities within Markham specifically. So as Sherry said, I'm very much an advocate for um, families of children with special needs within Markham only because those are the people that I seem to be working with a lot, but not exclusively. So I've learned a lot about them. Um, I would like to know who you are, and then I'll tell you a little bit about what I do. So put up your hand if you're a parent, okay? Put up your hand if you have a boy, a son. Oh, a few sons, usually with special education, we usually talk about sons more than daughters. Um, put up your hand if you're a student. Ah, what, where, where are you a student? Um, Sheridan College. Oh, at Sheridan College, what are you studying? Uh, social work. Oh, good for you. You know what, a lot of my job has evolved into social work. Um, put up your hand if you're an advocate. Okay, so most of you are really advocates. You know that, don't you? If you're a parent, you're an advocate. That's why you're here. Yeah, so that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about what my job is before we get started. Let's see, I think, there we are. Okay, we've done introductions. Um, who I am, what I do. And as I said, I am a single plan of care coordinator. And my job is to gather everyone together on a child's and family's team to develop a single plan of care. If you are a parent, you know that you are listening with one ear to the school, you're listening with another ear to your physiotherapist, you might have a private speech and language pathologist, you probably have a neurologist, um, uh, who else, Laura? <laughs> Somebody else. <laughs> CCAC, all giving you advice as to what is the most important thing that you should be doing for your child. And so most of the parents of the, of the children that I work with are just say, I can't do this anymore. I can't keep all of these balls in the air. What are we going to do? I want to tell you a little bit about my clients as well, because my clients run, every single one of them is different every single one of them. I work with children from ages about three and a half or four to 21. And um, I work with children um, who have physical disabilities. They are verbal. They're able to advocate for themselves. And they actually, I'm just really thinking about one of my clients right now and she wants to be a social worker. And then I have other children who are nonverbal. They require care for every single facet of their life and their families do not speak English, do not know where to go to get started, do not know what they're entitled to. So I run a great long gamut, which is really great for me because I am ADHD and I need a lot of stimulation in my life. So <laughs> that's, that's um, who I am and kind of what I do. So I want to talk to you today about the single plan of care process. 
Okay, so in Children's Treatment Network, which is a network in Simcoe and York specifically, we talk about the single plan of care process. And that means one plan presented to your physiotherapist, to the school board, developed collaboratively so we can all work together to take one tiny step forward for your child or for whoever. I'm going to talk a little bit about the process within Children's Treatment Network, but what I invite you to do, and I said to Sherry I was going to do this, I want you to think about how you could do it without having a single plan of care coordinator, because there are steps that I'm going to talk about that you could do to help your team come together. Um, there are never enough single plan of care coordinators within Children's Treatment Network. Every um, family who has a child with multiple disabilities would really like to have a single plan of care coordinator to walk alongside them, to support them, and to make sure that their voice is heard. And, um, but it, not everybody has one for a multiple of reasons, and I'm going to talk to you first about the referral process. So, how do people qualify for a single plan of care coordinator within Children's Treatment Network? There is usually a referral submitted by um, a family doctor. It could be by a provider, a physiotherapist, an occupational therapist. It could be submitted by the school. The school could say, little Johnny really, really needs some help at home. And we look at the home as one of the sources of needing help. It's not just, um, is that yours or? No, okay, here, <laughs> just sorry. Um, it's not just about school, it's not just about the doctor, it's, and it's not just about the child, it's about the family as well. When we think about who do we really need to help through this process. So a referral is made, Super simple, can be a phone call to Children's Treatment Network. It always has to be with um, consent from the family. The family has to be aware of the referral and they have to want it. Because you're going to see why you as a parent would have to want it. Because you are an integral part of the team. It's not something that we do for the family. It's something that we do alongside with the family. So. As part of the process, when the pro once the process is faxed or submitted by the doctor or whomever, um, there is a child and family interview and consent. Consent so that we can talk to one another, so that we can talk to other people. So you would get a phone call, you would say, I would like to interview you over the phone about your child. And we have something called access. The access department would say, yes, Yes, I hear that your child has multiple needs. They need physio or occupational therapy. They might need speech therapy. They might need some kind of um, ongoing consultation. Yes, it sounds like your child would qualify for a single plan of care coordinator to pull it all together. And um, we will put through a referral. What happens next for me and for my colleagues is that we might have your child assigned to us. We would be notified by phone, by email, saying, um, little Johnny, you have a new client. Doesn't happen quite that way because we have a wait list, but <laughs> little Johnny's going to be on your wait list and hopefully you can get to them soon because the family really needs help coordinating all of the services, accessing funding, accessing community services, all of those kinds of things. So then as a single plan of care coordinator, I receive that child's name. The first thing that I do is review an electronic record. So this is just kind of, I'm just going through this quickly because this isn't what you really want to hear about. This is just the steps that we take in order to get there. Um, what happens is the person who's interviewed you on the phone has recorded everything electronically. They've said the first thing is, may I have your consent to record this electronically so that other members of the team can access that information. So they will ask you questions about the child's birth. They will ask you lots and lots of questions about who are the doctors you're working with now, who are the, what are the services you're receiving in school, what are you, the services you're receiving in the community, and they will record all of that electronically 
it's saved under your child's name. It's private. We go through all kinds of privacy hurdles to get there to access that. And that is saved electronically. When I get a child's name, the first thing I do is go in and review that record. So already, I know what your concerns are. I know why you were referred. I know that you're hoping to get some physiotherapy for your son. I know that you are having difficulty, this is a, a big hit, having the school work with you as part of the team to access the services that you feel that you need within school and outside of school. So I've reviewed the record. I've read all of that. I've figured out what um, this family is about a little bit. Oh, by the way, if you want to interrupt me, just put your hand up, okay, if you have any questions. All right, so then what I do is I phone you and I say, hi, Johnny's mom or Jenny's dad. I would love to meet with you in person because you are the most important piece of this puzzle. Note that I don't go to the school and ask them what they think of Johnny and I don't phone the doctor. I call you first and I say, may I come to your home and could we talk? And so I am able to print the interview that they did on, with the electronic record, and I bring that with me. It's called the Child and Family Interview. It's very extensive. As I said, it takes about an hour. And before I get to your doorstep, I've highlighted all of the things I want to go deeper in. Um, let's say you report that your uh, daughter is nonverbal. I would highlight that because I want to talk about that. Does she have any words? Is she gesturing? I would want to go deeper and I'd want to know who's supporting your, you with that program. At Children's Treatment Network, we've talked a lot about um, children and what we want to talk about with parents. One thing I know about parents is, first of all, they're really, really tired of telling their same story again and again, and again. And people asking, do you have any reports for language? Do you have any reports? What is your most recent report? So that's the beauty of the electronic record. It actually stores all of that information so that when I arrive on your doorstep, I have the most recent speech and language report, if, if you've provided it. I have all of that information. So you don't have to tell me the story again. I really, really want to get to know your child. So I always start with the core strengths. We talk about core strengths. Tell me about your child. Tell me what your child is like. Don't tell me about what the physiotherapist says. Don't tell me what the speech and language pathologist said. Tell me what you say about your child. Why don't you guys tell me? Tell me one strength. For you. Yep. Sorry, I just wanted to quickly say yep. Exactly. And that's the struggle. That's a really good that's a really good point. I mean, you'll hear this as part of my presentation. By the time I come to a lot of families, not all families, they're feeling very disenfranchised. They're feeling that they don't have a voice and their voice is the most important thing because who knows the child better than the family? How, who has who spends day and night, because I know most of my clients have to be repositioned during the night. They're up several times during the night. Who knows that child and that family better than the person that I'm talking to? And I do um, love it if I can get the mom and dad together, because I know um, with some in some situations, there are different perspectives, whether you talk to mom and dad and whether you talk to them about what's important to them too. So. Um, Thank you, that was a really good point. So we talk about the core strengths, and as I said, able to communicate using gestures, sounds, responding to music. That's really, really important because that's what we build on. Sorry, I did make notes, and I should look at it. <laughs> um, we all, uh, the other one that is really important to me is a loving extended family. Who is your family? Maybe it's you and your husband, or maybe it's just you. Maybe there is no husband, but maybe there's grandma and grandpa. In a lot of my families, grandma and grandpa are the core caregivers because mom and dad are out working. And so I really, really want to have grandma at the meeting, and I usually invite grandparents to come to the meeting that we're going to talk about ultimately, because the plans that we make 
sometimes might not work with grandma and grandpa. You know, if we say, well, he needs to be in his stander for an hour a day and nobody's home but grandma, that's not going to happen. So that's not a goal that we can work towards. So then we talk about the, the core needs. And the core needs with a lot of my clients are always the same. Physical, well, he needs help with everything. He needs help with toileting. He needs help with feeding. He needs help with et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So those are the kinds of needs. Those are the activities of daily living. Physical might be. It's not just he needs a, thera a physiotherapist. We start the conversation with, why does he need a physiotherapist? What exactly does he need? Does he need to develop strength in standing? Is that what he needs? Does he need help with walking? Is that what he needs? Maybe you need phys or equipment. He doesn't have a stander. He doesn't have a walker. He doesn't have a wheelchair. So those are the kinds of things, those are needs that we have to talk about. Communication. I would say communication is the number one need that I talk to with most parents because all children want to be included at school. They want to be able to communicate at the most basic level. They want to be able to communicate their frustration and their needs beyond just crying. So we need to work on that and then, and then it goes from there. So, any questions about that slide? Oh, okay. All right, so once we have identified the strengths and the needs, the next thing that we do is we talk to the family about identifying their vision. This is where a single plan of care and, and working together as a big collaborative team differs from, let's say, an in-school team or an IPRC because other people are steering the ship. When you're talking about an in-school team meeting, an IPRC, even at a doctor's office, a doctor might tell you, this is what you need to do. This is the, the difference. When we talk about single plan of care development, we talk about the family. What do you envision for your child and family in the next 12 months? That forms the basis of our single plan of care, period. I always feel a little bit uncomfortable making this statement. Suppose when you go to sleep, a miracle happens and this issue is resolved. Um, what will be different when you wake up and what would it look like? We always start with families with this conversation, but I think it's a bit misleading. Because I mean, if, if I think of, a, of my son, let's say who, who, well, I'll give you a real example. My daughter has epilepsy. If I went to bed one night and I had a dream, I would dream that she didn't have epilepsy anymore. But then you know what? She wouldn't be the person she is. It's true. It's true. She's an exceptional young woman. And, and I think she's actually, just a little bit of a brag, <laughs> she's actually just finishing her PhD. And her PhD is on advocating for um, clients with epilepsy, with the medical system. So, you know, you have to think about your child, your family, and think about something that would make your life better. Um, and then what happens is, once we've talked about that, the visions, I record the visions in the family's words and I document it in the electronic record and identify it as the family's priorities for their child. All right? So just yeah. On yeah. Um, just because I've been through it. Yep. what is it that we're going to accomplish to make her um, independent? So it's always focused on getting her to be for independent living. What is she going to need in the future? And based on what grade they're in, um, sort of what their functionality is right now and where they are, you should really get a good feel of, you know, if she's going into kindergarten or grade two or grade three, what are the things that are important? Is it social? Is it academic? Exactly. And that sort of should guide how you about your vision. I'm so glad that you contributed. Yeah, I put a few up. Just to, No, it's okay. Um, so an example would be this particular client, the aggressive behavior was interfering at home and at school. And so what we decided as a T, even though the family, I mean, the family probably said something like, I want him to stop hitting. 
So we kind of worked it out. So you want the aggressive behavior to be understood because this child was not communicating. So we want to understand and we want it to s diminish, maybe not stop. When I wake up in the morning, maybe it's just diminished a bit so I can hold my head up. Another one was, here you go, she'll be able to feed herself at school and home because this is a child, I can think of one of my clients, who is 13 and she's still being fed. You know what, she can do it. But we just haven't focused on that. So it's a vision or so-and-so will be toilet trained. And we know she can do it. We know that there's no physical barrier. She, we just haven't worked on that. So thank you. Usually what we talk about, I don't know if I wrote that down. Now. Yeah. Okay. We usually think about two or three visions as um, tops for a child, for the team to talk about it. Because we're talking about for 6 to 12 months, this is a big vision a big one and you'll see how we kind of break it down into goals and activities then. So um, it assists the family to determine the focus of their child's single plan of care for the next 12 months. It's always based in, on the identified strengths and needs. So that's why I said the dream is a bit misleading, although we do use that language, because if we know the child is nonverbal, then we're not going to have a dream that he's going to talk within a year. But we, he might be able to communicate maybe his frustration within a year. So we kind of pare it down. So I record it, and then I gather it reports, contact information from the family, any other, and I ask you about who's working with your child? Who do you know is working with your child? Is there a physiotherapist at school? Is there an occupational therapist? What are their names? Could I have their phone numbers, please? All of that kind of stuff. And then, to me, this is really important, I establish a time when a parent is available for meetings with the team. And I usually ask both parents. So uh, dad works, let's say dad works at home Mondays and Fridays. I'm just thinking about a family I just met. So I know I'm going to have that meeting on a Monday or a Friday so mom and dad can both join. All right, so you start with that. You don't start with the school board saying, well, we only meet on Tuesdays. You start with when is the family available. Yep. I have several single mothers. In what way? Are you talking about two hands being the mother and father? Yeah. Oh, don't over, don't overestimate that. <laughs> Sometimes, in a lot of the cases, actually, and I, and I don't want to sound sexist in any way, but a lot of times, moms are the ones who are at home looking after the children out of necessity. They can't hold down a job because the school keeps calling them to come and get them because there are issues or whatever. So dad is out working. I, I, the reason I'm emphasizing it's lovely if I can have the mom and dad together because sometimes, ultimately, there are... Um, battling visions. And so if this is a good starting point, even if dad can't always come, right, Laura? Yeah. <laughs> even if dad can't always come, at least we've got a starting point. At least we hear what dad has to say, and I keep that in mind. The reason I keep that in mind is when it comes to breaking it down to goals and activities, if one of the activities is, let me think about this, um, one of the activities is that dad will take her swimming on Saturdays and dad doesn't want her to go swimming so he's not going to take her. In. There's no point. You don't go anywhere with it. But I have quite a few single moms who I work with and we work around that. It's a real issue around trying to find a team meeting time. So some, and I, this is a total aside, I have a lot of difficulties with some of my families who are being asked to come to meetings during the day and then one car in the family, so dad or mom has to take the day off or they don't have any car and they've got to take the bus. So all of those are real, real issues. But I think that I feel strongly enough that it's important to have someone from the family at the table to make these decisions that we work together to make it work. And if I can 
emphasize to the families that this is really important. It only happens once or twice a year twice a year max. It's not a monthly occurrence. And if I can say, you're going to have everybody from the school board who you need to have there, plus your therapist at the table, people can usually see the importance. I saw a question. A I just um, to your comment about how is that single mom going to do it? She is going to do yeah. it because she has to. Yeah. And there's no other choice. But there will come a time where she is going to be at her end. Yeah, like that's what I and that is like at the beginning she's going to be able to do it because she has like the adrenaline and she's going to be able to do it but once the child gets older and older yeah. she's going to have the problem so that's when you're really going to have to address that issue of support and that's where a spot coordinator would come in and address the needs that this mother will need to try and find respite and other types of help so that she will have a little bit more time in in not breaking down. A true disclosure here, Laura is one of my clients. <laughs> well, not Laura, but, but her daughter is. <laughs> yes. Uh, can I just add that um, I do have a husband. <laughs> <laughs> he, you never see him at the meetings. <laughs> yeah. Um, just because, uh, for us, because our daughter has multiple needs, it's a physical as well as other, um, one of us has always been at home. And now that she's older, even when he was at home, he was never really at home. And so what I've done now, because it became such a, sorry, okay. because it became such a big issue, I have a friend of mine who goes to me with these meetings, even if it's just for support and also for a different perspectives, because sometimes she has questions or comments that I hadn't thought about or I had forgotten. So a friend is just as good as a spouse, even maybe even better. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just realized we're being recorded, so I'll try to remember to give you a, a, <laughs> this. OK, thank you. All right, so the next question that I have for you, and just so that I can take two minutes away from talking, I'd like to t for you to invite you to turn to the person beside you or in a threesome or whatever. See if you can brainstorm how many members you have as part of your team right now. <laughs> and for you guys, brainstorm so you know who, or, no, or, or who they are, okay. who they are. You want to come join? <laughs> come join. <laughs> Be sociable. <laughs> I'm, quite, I'm quite happy of joining. Oh, are you? <laughs> but it's are you a mom? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I am. How old, what, what, how old is your, you have my children? My son is, well, I have three. Uh, my yeah. youngest is almost 10. Almost 10. Yeah, he has Down syndrome. Oh, he has Down syndrome. Yeah, I have a few clients with Down syndrome. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just Downs, or does he have multiple? Um, He's quite, he doesn't really have any multiple um, per se, but he's quite low on the spectrum in that he... He's only been walking for two years. Oh, okay. He had a diagnosis of the way, uh, as most children with Down syndrome, he has a heart, heart a repair. Heart yeah. Um, he went through leukemia. He went through the whole. Oh. So he's quite. Um, so he's, he's a little lower functioning. He's walking now. Um, in school, maybe. But just started, like a couple years. Yeah. Um, you know, speech wise, um, we have a. Um, an augmentative speech device. Oh, okay. So, and yeah. Is he a CTN client? Is it, what school board are you with? We're, we're with the Waterloo Board. Waterloo Board, okay. Yeah. Okay. Board. Yeah. So, which he, um, he actually got his augmentative speech device through Kids Ability. Oh, okay. But um, the um, augmentative speech uh, path at our school works with him as mm, well. Okay. In collaboration, so. Okay, can I bring you back? 
This is just a quick break. <laughs> okay, who do you have? Shout it out. Who do you have? Oh, yeah, case manager. Very important. Yep. Anybody else? That's it. PT, OT, keep going. SLP. SLP. Yeah, OGCOM. OGCOM, yep. <laughs> keep going. Work coordinator. Work core, oh yes, work experience. I don't know if everybody knows what that is, but we'll have to talk about that. Psychiatrist. Yeah. Psychiatrist. Well, I don't know if I can spell that. Yep, yes I can. <laughs> keep going. You could have a social worker. Social worker, whoops. Thank you. <laughs> a teacher. Principal. Yep. Uh, there's also the, um, the lead special needs person for that particular Cert. 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 Don't you love special ed acronyms? Uh, yeah. <laughs> it should be a test. <laughs> Cert. EA. Somebody said EA. Yep. Physiotherapist. Oh, feeding therapist, very good. Nurse. Feeding, yep, feeding therapist, nurse. Vision therapist. Vision therapist, yes. I don't know, is there a hearing therapist? Is there? Okay. But there, there is a... And there's hearing teachers, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's, that's good, that's great, yes. So imagine, oh, <laughs> no, I wasn't gonna write that. <laughs> I was gonna write doctor, <laughs> doctor for sure. <laughs> and then, and then um, oh, um, orthotist. How many of your children wear AFOs? Yeah, orthotist. IBI for sure, ABA, yes, um, tutor, <laughs> speech therapist, speech therapist, Sp yeah, yep, yeah, that's an acronym, speech language pathologist, <laughs> grandma, oh yeah, let's not forget about grandmas. <laughs> therapist. Recreation therapist, yes. Yep, they often join the meetings. Okay, good enough. Um, I actually f um, moved your slides around a little bit, so you might you have to might have to look for. Oh, there it is. Okay, yeah, she's got the old one too. I want to look at this slide because what I found when I was talking to parents, sometimes there was a confusion of roles. Um, there were expectations of providers that aren't necessarily meeting reality. And I don't want to spend a long time on this, but you can think about it. The team member, what their responsibility is, who they communicate with, and what their environment is. And the reason I created this slide is for a presentation I did a while ago was um, in York Region Board, I'm gonna speak about my work environment now. Um, the OT, CTN OT, is, is responsible for rehab. They can go to parents, they can come to a school team, but they go into the school and home. In York Region District School Board, I'm looking for the school board OT, for instance, cannot go into the home. So it, it's, a big issue. it's a big issue. It's a big That's issue. So when people say, oh, we're going to have our team meeting, but the CTN OT can't come, but that's okay. And we say, but that's not okay, because they, they are the folks that are going to go into the home, that are going to help you with the OT goals within the home. So it, it's not okay. So this is just for you to consider. And I'm sorry, because every school board is different. And we were just talking about Waterloo. Every school board is different. This is from my perspective with the public board. The Catholic, York Catholic board is different. We were talking about York Catholic. The CTN OT in the Catholic system is the same as the school OT. So that's kind of good news. That's kind of a cool thing. Yeah. So, so. <laughs> um, 
Okay, just, I'm going to put this on and ask the question again, just so that everybody can hear it, please. I was just clarifying that then for you, that's not an issue as a single plan of care coordinator because it's already within your area the therapist both is able to come. They, they have those two areas that they're covering, both home and school. Yeah. So how do you get around that, other than the development of the special needs strategy and implementation of it, yeah. whoever knows when. It's coming to it's a school coming board near to school. you. Yeah. <laughs> right, okay. It's coming to a school board near you. Service coordination is. That's a whole different discussion that we need to have. Um, so I'm going to keep going. At the beginning of the single plan of care process, oftentimes, the very first time, the providers will meet. I don't love that. I don't love to think about any meeting when the parent is not there. Sherry and I were talking about this earlier. I was going through the CTN binder and it lays out a process for the single plan of care coordinator to meet with the team and the providers, not necessarily as a whole team, but individually. The reason it's important is because we need to discuss roles and reflect on the process of teaming. Because my job is really to form a team. If I could form a really good team and everybody was listening to everybody and working together, I could disappear. You wouldn't need me anymore. If, if I felt that your team, you were truly, truly listening to each other and working together as a team. I'm not sure that you would really need me in the picture at all. So I remember when we started, I think seven or eight years ago now, Children's Treatment Network, the first single plan of care meeting I actually facilitated, I sat down and we started talking about a, a young person who had autism and some physical needs. And we started talking about communication. And the school board people said, we don't need to do that because we are we have our our plan all laid out and this is the plan and so it took actually some intervention by a couple of people higher up in the board to intervene in that situation and say hey it's a different game now this is what single plan of care is it's working together it's working with family and with outside providers to come up with one plan so at, if I met with a team, we would briefly discuss the, child's, the, the child and family's strengths, needs, and visions. That's it. And then we would establish when they are available for a date. And I always do a range of dates. I say, hey, in this week, when are you free? Because uh, if you've worked with providers at all, they have really busy schedules. Whoop, okay, we've done that one. Okay, so I've set the date. We've set the location. My clients are all school-aged, so 90% of the time we are either meeting at, at, um, at the school, which is convenient for most of the providers. I sometimes we meet at Holland Bloorview if we're transitioning a child from Holland Bloorview to the school board. Um, we have had meetings in a home when it's just impossible for the family to get out and the child to get out. And this was a child who was at home more than at school. We've had a meeting at home. But generally speaking, that's what we do. We meet at the school. I send an invitation out to all, including the parent. <laughs> and I set the agenda. I include all of the attendees. And I spread my net really wide. And I say, is there anybody else I should be thinking about? And in that, I include the visions that we have developed together. OK, so we're at the meeting. I have to look at my notes because I was thinking about something that I really, ah. What I didn't put in this slide, but I really want to talk about is the environment of the meeting space. How many of you, especially if you've had your child in kindergarten, have gone to a meeting and sat on kindergarten chairs? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's not particularly respectful if you think about it. If you sit at little tables and little chairs. I know it doesn't bother you, but that's what it's all about, is setting an even playing field. Right? So table for everybody to sit around the table, not to have two tiers, people sitting behind people. And um, I usually um, make sure that I save a spot for the family beside me especially if English is not their first language. I, of course, we would have a translator if English is really not their first language. But if they're having difficulty or if they haven't sat in a meeting with 15 other people before, it's kind of nice to sit beside someone who is checking in with them. 
um, I want the family to be treated as an equal partner in this meeting. So they are, we start with introductions. Generally speaking, I like to start with the family. You know, I'll start and introduce myself, talk about that we're here for a collaborative team meeting. Then I start with the family and ask them to introduce themselves and go all the way around the room. Noting that I've handed out an agenda with everyone's name on it already and their job so that you can look at the person, you can figure out, oh, that's the school physiotherapist. I've never met them before. I've heard about them, never met them. So we do that. Um, and then we share the visions. This is what I always do. So I establish the norms. We're here for an hour. We're going to listen to each other. We are going to focus on the visions. I don't care whether the occupational therapist wants to talk about the gym program or the physiotherapist talks about the gym program. That's not part of the vision today. That's something else you can talk to mom about another time, talk to the teacher about. But today, we want to talk about the behavior that's been exhibited at home and school. We want to talk about the communication. And we want to talk about the feeding. I'm just throwing this out. Um, so the first thing I wrote down is a set of baseline. In the beginning, when we started it, um, developing single plan of care, we would invite the physiotherapist. And then I would say, OK, we're going to talk about the use of the stander. Um, uh, Laura, could you talk about where so-and-so is right now with the stander? And what we found was happening is the physiotherapist prepared a report. And she started reading from the report and would go all through the report. And so we had to kind of educate each other. Hey. We've only got one hour because we're respecting the time that everybody has committed to this process. We don't have time to hear about the ankle flexion and all of that kind of stuff. We're going to talk about the standards. So how is he right now? And if Vanessa is the best person to report, I usually ask the parent to report. How much is he using the standard at home? And I ask the teacher to report. And then we say, OK, where do we want to go from there? He's using the standard. Is it the walker that we want to go to next? Or do we need a different standard? Tell me what we need to do. We talk about it. All right, so we're setting the baseline around the vision. Then we, I'm going to talk more about this. Set new goals, identify activities and leads. I always check in with the family. Have we talked about everything that you hoped that we would talk about? And then we set a follow-up date for a meeting. And I wrote down here, frequency is determined by the timelines. CTN has told us to have no more than one or two a year, just because it, it takes so many people. Think about the money that it costs to have everybody around the table and the time, et cetera, et cetera. So we try to limit it to one or two times a year, but it depends. OK. How many of you have heard about SMART goals? OK. So a couple of you have heard a talk about SMART goals before. I'm going to go through this really quickly because I'm very cognizant of, uh, of the time. Um, the goals have to be SMART. SMART is an acronym. They have to be specific. What exactly do we want to achieve? What exactly? Where, how, when, with whom, what are the conditions and limitations? So an unspecific is I want to get in shape. My specific is I want to work out five times a week, include cardio in each session, three days of weightlifting, and two days of yoga. I'm just going to see. Oh, I didn't include any specific ones here. So Sherry, can you think of a SMART goal? <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot, because I know your daughter is involved yeah, with. Has SMART goals with her augmentative uh, communication. And um, for her, it, it's broken down in her how many times a day is going to help her. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, so she has smart goals for augmentative communication. It's broken down, for instance, um, how many times a day the school staff is going to help her to access her, her um, communication device. And then it's further broken down to um, how independently she's able to do it. And then they're going to record um, how they see, how, how they think they how successful she was and that she needed um, a bit of redirection or hand over hand um, and kind of with whom helped her and then how I guess they just there's a lot of data recorded too to yeah. see how for, for yeah. long she's moving so Ashley we use her communication day or um, her communication device um, at least 
I'm, I'm just making this up now, six times a day with support to communicate a choice between two activities. At least. At least 40 times a day. <laughs> okay, at least 40 times. I think actually, I yeah. think in her, like in her goal, we would love 40 times a day, but realistically in the school environment, the teacher would only agree to at least 10 times That's a day. That's why I said that number. You know, so <laughs> But we're always pushing for more. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So at, at least, and then we put a deadline by, so let's say we were setting this, it's April, by September 2016, we want that done. Okay. They have to be measurable because if you don't make it measurable, how are you going to get there? So if we want Johnny to use the standard at least 30 minutes in the morning and 30 minutes in the afternoon by September 2016. That's measurable. I will know that. So I, I actually made this, yeah, I actually made this one up. Sam will make a choice between two pictures to request an, active, or an activity independently at home and at school environment by June 2016. So that's a very, very measurable goal. Attainable. Is it attainable? So is that attainable? I have a client who can only use his standard for two minutes without being in pain right now. So is it realistic to think of him being 30 minutes in the standard by September? That's where we would turn to the physiotherapist and say, is that attainable? And she would say, yes, if he had new AFOs and if two people are able to put him in the standard. So, okay, that is attainable. Being realistic with your goals, losing 10 pounds a week, not realistic. Two pounds, probably not either. <laughs> but the other thing that I thought is, weigh the effort, time, and other costs your goal will take against the other obligations and priorities in your life. If you're a single mom and you want him to use the standard for an hour every night, is that realistic? It's probably not because you've got two other kids and you've got to feed them and get them ready for bed. So I like this quote, goals are dreams with deadlines. And that's exactly what an attainable, okay. Is it relevant? You have to think, so people might pitch out goals at this meeting um, for Ashley to go into the community and say hello to six people. Is that a realistic goal? Maybe not. Maybe not. So again, then you'd have to speak up and say, you know what, that's not a realistic goal. That's not going to happen. We're not going to do that. So think about why you want to reach the goal. And that's what we talk about all the time. Let's make the goal real. Yes. Sorry, I just want to add, like that might be a great long-term goal. Yeah. You just have to make how to get there. Exactly. So we're talking about how to get there. We're breaking down your vision into small goals that if we are going to meet in six months, we want that goal met in six months time. Thank you. Thank you. Agree upon the deadlines and go after them. Keep the timeline realistic and flexible. Okay. So this is the part where we have a goal and we then identify who, who's going to take the lead and what is going to happen. So I'm going to share this one with you. So this child will use a stander at school and home for at least 20 minutes daily in each environment by the fall of 2016. The PT is going to be the school lead because she's going to keep track of whether your son or daughter is able to do that or not. I mean, mom might phone and say, he's getting a lot of redness from his AFO or he's really complaining after three minutes. I think there's something going on. So that's the PT has to monitor that. But these are the activities that we're going to do. School team and family will provide preferred books to keep him busy while he's in the standard. So H hates being in the standard, but we all know it's good for him. We all agree that that's what we wanna to do to strengthen his, his legs. So how are we gonna get there? This is one activity. Mom, do you agree that you're gonna do that? Yes. Does the school agree? Yes, it's on paper. They're gonna provide books or an iPad or whatever. And he's going to wear his AFOs. That means the school has to put the AFOs on when he goes in the standard, take them off when he gets out of the standard. And the PT will observe him in his standard at home and school and make adjustments as needed. Clear? Yeah. Yeah. These smart goals that you agree upon, they have to go into your child's IEP. 
Uh, that's not necessarily across the board. That's that's. Uh, it would be lovely if it did. I agree with you. I it it yeah. I'm not even going to say should <laughs> because I mean it. I'm going to say it's a really good idea because the whole idea is we're working together. Hey, we're working as school and home together. So if we all agree this is going to happen, this is it should it, it yes it would be nice if it was. Absolutely. So after the single plan of care meeting, what happens? So everybody says, yay, that was a great team meeting. Do we all go away and say, okay, see you in six months or a year? No. So the one thing is that as a single plan of care coordinator, I have to record those collaborative goals with the activities in the record after the meeting. So I record all of that. The problem is that not everybody accesses the electronic record. The, uh, anybody who is a CTN employee has access if permission is given by the family to see it. So the CTN OT has access, the physiotherapist, the speech and language pathologist has access. They can read it, they can look at it and say, hey Judy, you got that wrong. That's not what we said we were going to do. We said we were going to do um, elbow prompting with the communication device. We, we didn't say that we were going to let him do it independently. So that's the good thing. The other good thing is that they can um, also um, refer to it to keep on track with what their job is. My other job, which I'm very bad at, by the way, is completing the single plan of care and sharing it with the family. Because, I, you know, you sit down and you do it and then you go on to the next thing. So th this is important. This is very important because you expect the providers and the family to keep track of how we're doing with the goals and activities. And then the other thing is that my goal or my job is to look at the notes because what we do as um, single plan of care coordinators and providers, we make a note. So every time the OT goes to your home and advises you on feeding, she will make a note in the record and check it. And then I can go in and read it. So I know exactly how we're moving towards the goals and activities. Okay, and then the team members can document towards that goal. So I'm, I'm almost done. It's really funny when I was trying to think about summing everything up. This is actually the same model that I used for developing an IEP. So Sherry, it's, it's funny that you mentioned that because this is the single plan of care process. You gather information, you set the direction with the family, you develop the plan as a team, you carry out the planned activities, and you review, and you start again. <laughs> and you just keep going. If you ever reach the point where all of your planned activities and goals are met, then you're, the child is discharged <laughs> from single plan of care coordination. I just wanted to say one more thing, and then if you do have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. When I started developing this, I was hoping to develop it in such a way to empower you as a parent to follow the single plan of care process on your own. So even if you don't have a single plan of care coordinator, you might be able to think about this. And I think there are elements of this presentation that you could take to heart and you could implement on your own. But I will also acknowledge roadblocks. And one of the biggest roadblocks is probably the school board that you're working with. Because as I said, school boards are used to working, they have their in-school team process, they have an IPRC, they're used to working within their, their parameter, parameters, and it really is a bit mind-blowing for them to start thinking about the child outside of the school environment. So one of the jobs that we do as single plan of care coordinators is to try to expand that understanding that the child is in school for X now hours of the day, but the child's at home a lot more. And you know, with a let's say with a typical child, you might say, well, he's, he's actually awake more at school, but I know our children are awake at night too. So I know the reality of their life and their family's life. So, um, I would love to empower you and say, go forward and present those visions. And why not? Let me know how you do. <laughs> yes? I just want to get a little bit of clarification. Sure. The job yep. So, you know, you, you, um, you organize your 
organized the meeting, you set all that up, which you know I've gone through and I understand. Um, and you said that only happens really, I think, officially once. Once or twice a year. Once and then mm -hmm. that second time from mm -hmm. you know what we're experiencing. It happens a second time, but I think it's not even officially called a SPOC meeting. Um, I, I don't know, but that, I think it's okay. As you said, it's once or twice. Um, what 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 else do you do? Like, what happens? Oh, nothing. The rest of the <laughs> year, like you know, I guess how are you? You know, how are you in, in, in involved? involved? Like, and and I guess my other concern or question is, you know, a lot of these things that you talked about there, you know, the the wearing the AFOs or AKFOs and what happens and. You know, a lot of the issues they, you know, you, you bring them up at a meeting, you know, once a year, but it's it's really a changing, a dynamic, and ongoing process. Sure so we is. can set all these goals yeah. and everybody's together and we do it. But what happens like next month and two months from now as, as, as things change, you know, and we're not having that. And I understand, I realize that everybody's busy and it's hard to have a meeting like that, you know, on a monthly yeah. basis. But, you know, I think that's my you know, my concern of how do I continue that over the year? Like having that one meeting is great, but you know, how does how do we how do you continue that yeah. through the year? I, so yeah, that's a great question. So first of all, the reality is very few of my clients have just one meeting a year, because the the most complex clients we can't just meet once a year. It is so dynamic, so changing. So to use the example of putting the AFOs on at school, it's my job to check in with the school or with the physio or the occupational therapist. How are things going? Did so and so get a new pair? And actually my team members are really great in letting me know what's happening, as are the parents as are the parents calling me and saying, hey, I'm looking for summer camp. Can you help me do that? Can you help me with the funding for summer camp? Hey, I, haven't, I don't have my ACSD or special services at home. Can you help me with that? So there are a few things that I do, but as going back to the single plan of care, my job is to monitor progress. And if we know there isn't progress, do we need to meet as a smaller team? Like, do I need to meet with the school to figure out what is going on like why isn't he being put in the standard I hear things like well our school day doesn't provide for him to use the walker anymore yeah but we agreed to that so how are we going to make that happen so I might bring in the uh, physiotherapist and with the three of us might talk together with the teacher so I do um, school visits um, home visits definitely as you know home issues um, come up um, that's kind of, yeah, so. So you would do more follow-up meetings, even I guess then in that case with the smaller groups, so if it's a physiotherapy mm -hmm. um, issue, then you would, you could set up more meetings, like specifically with the physiotherapy. Absolutely, the, absolutely. I didn't, I didn't yeah. know that, and that's my, you know, a little bit of my confusion, and I have two children mm -hmm. uh, with special needs, and they're both very complex, like it's, it's, they're very complex issues, and, um, and you know, and I, and, and I might be at fault because I don't understand the, the role of the spa coordinator, you know, well enough, and that's why I'm here. So yeah. I, and, and we, you know, I do need a lot of that assistance, but I didn't know that I could do that. I could contact my spa coordinator and say, Absolutely. Oh, you know, I'm having this issue with, you know, with whatever you assist me. Like, I, yeah. Yeah. So I, that's a, I um, personally, I find that. I've had a spot coordinator for quite a few years now. My daughter's 11 and she has complex needs. And I would engage the spot coordinator um, when I had issues with the school that I could tell were challenging, that they weren't that comfortable with. Then it was just another support person to call on to say, oh, hey, because um, they were really good at talking the school talk. Yeah. And just yeah. someone else to bring in to support you. Um, if when you, because probably initially you first go right to the teacher, hey, mm -hmm. You know, I'm concerned about this, and if you and if you sense that it's hard for them, then it's then it's just a, a wonderful resource to just bring someone else in. Yeah, and I don't want to say that we are advocates, but certainly we can take on an advocacy role within the context of the team. Yeah. I try. <laughs> Um, you're more of a neutral party between and a liaison between the parent yeah. and all the other coordinators. Yeah. So there's kind of a little bit less emotion That's involved right. into the whole process. 
Yeah. You had a question in the back. Um, yeah. So or, we don't, um, I don't have a, I'm not fortunate enough to have a spot coordinator. Um, I am the spot coordinator. Yeah, um, which is great. Mom. Yeah, <laughs> and um, just in um, just in comment to what you were saying about contacting people, uh, one of the things that I found most effective because realistically, when you have you know potentially you know ten, fifteen people involved, uh, one thing that I found very effective was believe it or not, just like email. So we will have our meeting mm -hmm. in September at the school with OT, PT, um, everybody involved. I will pull in my occupational therapist and mm -hmm. physiotherapist, but then periodically throughout the year, I will blast an email to 15 people and say, this is where my son is at with speech, this is where my son is at with OT, and I will give all the goals and my visions, and I will ask for feedback. I will say to my physiotherapist, can you please let me, let, let the, the team know um, where we are, where you are with spe uh, with uh, physio right now, and what he's working on, so that you know whether it's home or school or daycare, um, everybody gets to hear what my physiotherapist at home is doing, so that they can say at school, oh wow, okay, well we're not doing this. Maybe Perfect. we need to look at it. And the fee I started that a couple of years ago because again, realistically. Pulling all of these people in a meeting is challenging. Oh. Time is always a, a huge factor. And I can sit down at my, um, when I have time, and do an email and say, you know, here's where we're at. I want everybody's feedback. And um, for the few years that I've been doing it, I've had most of my therapists have come back and said, we really love that you do this because it just gives everybody a window yeah. as to how my child is doing like on a round on a round basis so thank you that's what i found worked best for i us. find mostly that the providers want me to pull together a meeting i don't mm -hmm. have very much um very many people not wanting to have a meeting yeah. i forgot to add one important piece of the spock process and that is the importance of integrating the goals when you said the physiotherapist wants me to do this and the speech language pathologist wants me to do this lot a lot of our really good deep conversation is around integrating that like if a child does not have access to a communication tool so the OT and the speech language pathologist talking together about how are we going to make that happen is probably the richest conversations that we have at these meetings is how can we all all make this happen so it it all happens together Laura Sorry. Um, it's just also it's really nice that the team also realizes that they're they are not the only ones who have goals that they also the speech language has you know three goals the PT has three goals the OT yeah. the speaking, and then they realize that this one parent or two parents cannot accomplish all those goals in that one day and all of a sudden realize that that's why a parent is not always doing these goals. So then they realize they can maybe integrate part of those yeah. goals all together. I'm really aware of the time. It's 12, 10, and people are out grabbing lunch. So I don't want you to miss out on lunch. So thank you very much. It was thank a great you, conversation. Thank you, Judy. We just wanted to give you a oh, thank, thank you, you for yes. talking to us. Oh, <laughs> you're welcome. It was good. It was a good conversation. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.